I'm Joel Margolis, your host, and with me today is Ms. Laura Donaldson, a native of Chicago who is not only a disabled person, but a disabled person who has been active in the field of disability rights. Laura, I understand that you have been a member of the group called DRAC, D-R-A-C-H, which was formed or at least sponsored by Access Living. Could you tell us what is it that DRAC does? DRAC is a av advocacy group that it was formed around housing. Um, a distant, dis, um, a disproportionate number of people with disabilities are phased out of housing for many number of reasons. And DRAC, our mission is to give us um, equal access to housing in the communities we're currently in or that we'd like to be in. Okay, and so DROC is essentially then pursuing the mission of making sure that the disabled have equal opportunity in the housing market. Yes. Is DROC also involved in petitioning or urging for financial help for specialized housing for the disabled? Not necessarily specialized housing, but um, equal access to housing in the sense that it won't be such a burdensome thing to have the housing modified. Currently in the city, it is a waiting list for modifications. And once the funding is gone, it's gone. And that's a big problem because a disproportionate number of us have to have modifications to our home in one way or another in order for us to live in the home. Now, what do you mean by modification? Could you give us some concrete examples? Um, if you need a ramp to get in a home, um, it doesn't necessarily come with the home. It has to be uh, um, added added on. Thank you to the home for you know for a person in a wheelchair or that needs the assistance to get in the home by themselves or with further assistance. That would be, you know, a modification. Or for someone like myself who needs a shower bars to bathe themselves. Now, you say when the money is used up, it's gone. What is exactly is this pool of money? Um, uh, the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities has a fund and I'm not sure who funds it, but I think that is, is part of HUD, Housing and Urban Development. I'm not sure specifically, but I, I think that that's where the But it's the city that gives out the money yes. to specific projects? Yes. And you're saying that there are concerns in DROC that when this fund is exhausted, it will not be renewed? Um, I think it's more on a case-by-case -case basis. But I'm not sure because um, where I live, I did not need to use the fund because my apartment is already accessible for me. So I, I um, have not needed to use the fund, so I wouldn't know the specifics. Now, in pursuit of its goals of equal opportunity in housing for the disabled or making sure that funds for modification are available, what kind of activities does DROC pursue? Do DROC members write their congressmen? <coughs> what kind of things specifically do DROC members do to try and promote the goals? Um, to promote our goals, um, we have in the past advocated for more transparency by the city um, as far as accessible housing in public housing because a dis, per, dis, uh, big portion of the people that are on CHA's waiting list, I believe the number is still about 40%, are people with disabilities. And for a great number of, number of us, we're still waiting for, you know, housing that is suited to us and for us. Now, in order to promote better service to the disabled, 
Will DROC members do such things such as stage a protest? Oh, we have, we have. And we do that to put light on the issue, to say that it has worked in the past is an understatement, but for me personally, that is a st sad statement for the city of Chicago when we promote one Chicago. Because to me, when you say one Chicago, that means that everyone is treated equally, and it's not so. Now, do DROC members also do things such as visit the offices of aldermen or possibly oh, yeah. state legislators? Yes, we, we do. We have um, petitioned particular aldermen on certain issues, and one of our um, unending goals is to have access in the city as a whole where affordable housing is available to us, for us. And <clears throat> as you, a dis disability rights advocate, look at the current national political situation with Trump in the White House and so on, what are some of your concerns about the rights of the disabled in the context of the current national administration? We're sorely under, you know, we are overlooked consistently, and that's sad. With all of the strides we've made in the last 26, 27 years, it seems to me that he has forgotten about the Americans with Disabilities Act. I don't know if it's an oversight um, by his advisors or him personally, but it just seems to be a big oversight. When you say strides in the last 26 or 27 years, you're responding to a specific point in time, 26 or 27 years ago, as an important benchmark? Yeah, um, that is when the Americans with Disability Act was signed into law. And I thought, wrongly, obviously, that it would make it easier for us to be integrated into the community because we, we one hurdle, I thought that, you know, once we reached that hurdle, it would be easier. No. Uh, so it, it seems that once we've gotten one hurdle, jumped over one hurdle, we still have more hurdles to... to so you see the Americans with Disability Act as clearing a major hurdle, but you speak about other hurdles. What hurdles do you see disabled people facing now in the current political system? In this current political climate, we are very uncertain about how the cuts in services will affect us. Well, you certainly don't anticipate that the Americans with Disabilities Act will be repealed, do you? I don't know what to say about that because with the current pre president and presidency, he has no real understanding of what that has done or can do for us in the future. And I'm not sure if he even, you know, understands what kind of a foundation that has put forth for us as a country or as a group of people. When you talk about your fear of cuts, okay, in federal funding, what are some of these areas where you fear that cuts in funding might come, and how specifically would they impact the disabled? Um, I heard that one of the cuts he's trying to make um, is to food stamps. For a good portion of us, the um, food stamps is a good portion of our well-being. And some of us, because we have received a um, cost of living increase, our food stamps have been cut. For some, it's not a big deal. But for others, it is a bigger deal than most. 
So you see a possible cut in food stamps yes. as having a particularly hard impact on the disabled. Yes. Okay. In what area, other areas of federal funding do you see cuts as impacting the disabled particularly? Medical coverage. Such as Medicare or Medicaid? Both. Because there are things that are covered now that if he cuts, that would impact our way of life. When you say way of life, do you mean the ability of the disabled to get necessary medical care? Um, to maintain our health or, or medi medical care, period. Um, there are things that are uh, a necessity for us to live our day-to-day -day lives. If those things are cut, that would greatly impact our independence. And possibly force some members of the disability community to move back into institutional settings? Yes. Which is something that members of the disability community are opposed to and also fear could happen to them? Absolutely. Okay. We fought so long for our independence that it, ha it being said that it might be taken away from us again, that is a big fear. Okay. Now, tell me a little bit about yourself and your own route in life to becoming a disability activist. Uh, were you born here in Chicago? Yes, I was. And raised here? Yes, absolutely. And did you have to live with disabilities from birth onward? Yes. Okay. As a result, did you receive special education? Yes. Was that in the Chicago public schools or yeah. in private schooling? Public schools. And where did you go to school? Um, I am an alumni of Jane Neal. It is here in the city and also of Spalding. And what and where is Spalding? Spalding is at, um, my goodness, uh, 1628 West Washington. And that is a school of what sort? Um, it was a school for persons with disabilities. Elementary? Elementary, high school, and Head Start. And you were a graduate of there? Yes. Now, after your education in a specialized school such as Spalding, and becoming a high school graduate, did you pursue any higher education at the college level? Yes, I did. And where was that? I went to Harold Washington. For how long were you there? I was there for hmm, on and off for quite some time. Um, I did not receive my degree, but if I give, I'm given the opportunity to return to accomplish that, would be a great thing for me. And what did you study while you were at Harold I Washington? I studied education. Okay. Now, after you finished your education at Harold Washington, did you have any work experiences or did you find yourself completely shut out of the labor market? Um, as far as work, while at Harold Washington, I was able to use to my benefit the work study program. And what did that lead you to, or what did you do in the work study program? Um, I was a part of the interna International Students Office, which is the place where international students come to study. Um, it is responsible for uh, helping them to uh, obtain visas to come here to study. So you were working with international students helping them? Yes. Okay. Now, about how long did you do that? Um, for, I think, a year. Okay. Now, after you finished that and left Harold Washington College, did you have any other employment experience? Yes, I did. I um, worked briefly for a restaurant, the Food Bucket. And what were you doing there? Um, my job entailed taking orders and giving suggestions to the customers as to the food fare that was available to them. 
And about how long did you do that? Um, I worked there for about six months. So how long then have you been without work? I have um, been without employment for over, I would say, five years or more. Okay. And that has shaped your feelings and your attitudes in what way? Um, in what way? I am more selective about the jobs that I interview for because my biggest fear is to be hired to look good on paper, where I know that I'm more capable than to just be a window piece. And has your experiences in the labor market also shaped your attitude towards disability activism? Yes. In what way? Because I know that we are more than capable of being window dressing. We are able to do a, a myriad of things, if only given the opportunity. So you see then that the disabled in many cases are being used as puppets or just showpieces in the labor force? Yes, and that's unfortunate, especially in my case. And you're definitely committed to combating that type of window dressing approach? Absolutely. And it sounds like you are very firm in your commitment. I want to thank you for coming and talking with us today. Thank you very much. Laura. Sir. I've been speaking with Ms. Laura Donaldson, an activist in the area of disability rights. I'm Joel Margolis, host and lead interviewer for Voice of the Disabled, which is brought to you by Can TV Studios and produced by Adapter Chicago Productions. I want to thank you for joining us today and urge you to join us again whenever we have a broadcast of Voice of the Disabled. Thank you for being with us, and I look forward to your joining us again. Goodbye, but only for now.